Okay, good evening, everybody, and thanks for joining us. Um, I just have an apology to make at the, right at the start, and that is due to me living in South Africa. We have technical issues because we have some amazing thing called load shedding, and that's basically where the uh, energy supplier just suddenly um, puts the electricity off. So we are due to have that any moment now. So I'm kind of on a phone hotspot and I might suddenly go into darkness. We've got a generator which hopefully will kick in, but uh, we need backups. So I've asked Simone to host the meeting tonight, just so in case I suddenly disappear, at least uh, the meeting can proceed. So with that, uh, you know, slight inconvenience, hopefully it will all work fine though. Um, I, I, I'm really, really happy to welcome Mike Gleason tonight. Um, he's a guy that I've known about since I started my studies way in the early um, 1990s. And as an athlete myself, I was often getting ill and um, I came across this field called exercise immunology and was fascinated. Okay, can we do certain things within our training and our nutrition patterns to actually improve our immune status and therefore le get less, uh, less sick? And um, I thought that was brilliant. So I have studied it to a point over the years and I've definitely kept a good interest. And um, I first interacted with Mike, it was probably about five years ago, I think, um, when Mike came on to Sports Nutrition Live um, down in London and did a presentation for, for us, and I've basically kept in touch ever since. Um, tonight, he has agreed to talk on exercise immunology and also the UEFA consensus statement that uh, he's been a big part of that's, uh, that's um, it's 19, sorry, 2019, so it's an imminent um, consensus. So I'm gonna basically ask him some pre-arranged questions, but as we kind of chatted earlier, we'll try and keep it fairly fluent. So the stuff that's burning for me to ask, I'll, I'll throw it out and see what uh, response Mike has. Um, we probably won't have too much time for questions tonight because he's got quite a, a load kind of lined up for you. Um, but what we'd like to do is if you have questions that we, ha we can't get to, we'll use the Integrative Sports Nutrition Facebook page uh, and do a bit of an interaction on that. So, Mike, I'd like to just hand over to you now. And I've got first question lined up for you and that's basically you retired from academia a couple of years back after a long and distinguished career but you certainly haven't slowed down and become one of the you know the old tennis buddies at the local club and sip your beer on a weekend you're still very very active in the field so give us uh, an update where you are currently well to be honest i do actually play a bit of tennis, I do sip a beer, a few beers at weekend, but uh, yeah, I've been doing a lot of work uh, writing really. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm no longer at research active. I don't do many lectures now, but I'm, I've, been, I've been writing a fair bit. Um, could, we, could we possibly bring up the first slide and we can, I can show a few people what, what I've actually been doing? But uh, to, just to talk over that until the slides appear, you'll see I've been uh, working on a few uh, IOC uh, consensus statements. Um, these were two that were done a few years ago now on uh, the impact of uh, trading load on both injury and, uh, and risk, of, risk of illness. And if we could have the next one. Uh, and also then a year later in 2017, a consensus statement on immunonutrition and exercise that was organized by the International Society of Exercise and Immunology. And then, of course, I've been, uh, you might have noticed, I've been writing uh, books. The first one uh, is out, which you can see on the next slide. Uh, the Sport Nutrition book, now in its uh, sort of third edition with the uh, 
Aska Yukendrup. That's been going since 2004 now. And this is the, uh, say, the third edition. If we move on to the next slide, please. You can see how it's expanded over the years. Uh, it's now over 602 pages long. It's got 17 chapters. That's one additional chapter from last year, an additional 125 pages and a lot more references. And that just reflects the expansion in general of the, the knowledge base in sport nutrition that's been going on in the last couple of decades. Um, so very proud to have uh, got that together with ASCA. We got that out. That took about two to three years to write, to do all the updates, because we wanted to update every single chapter to bring it bang up to date, which it is. So hope people enjoy reading that. And then uh, the next slide, please. I was just going to say, Mike, um, I've now got second and third edition, and yeah, they're fabulous textbooks. Well, thank you very much, Ian. Uh, and then this is a new venture for me, the first sort of solo book I've done, as it were. And what I wanted to do with this was really to, you know, apply everything we've learned from talking about diet and exercise and fitness and training with athletes to the general public to actually improve the general health of the, of the public and, uh, you know, help them to become healthier, live longer, avoid things like type 2 diabetes and cancer. And it's all about eating right, doing the right sort of exercise and enough of it, you know, sleeping good, keeping good personal hygiene and all that sort of thing. So it's essentially a, a guidebook towards a healthy lifestyle. Uh, not aimed at students anymore, not aimed at academics, but aimed at, uh, you know, Joe Bloggs in the street who wants to get themselves a little healthier as they get older. And is that now written, uh, Mike? Have you, have you got uh, it? it is, that, yeah, that, that should be available now in uh, no, around about November. The, the publishers definitely wanted to get it out before Christmas so people could buy it for their loved ones, their friends and that, so that you can get it in the, in the Christmas stockings, uh, you know, as a nice present for Christmas. And then, of course, it's their new year when everybody makes their new year resolutions to actually do something to improve their, their lifestyle. So, you know, it's, it, it's timed for that, really. Uh, yeah, this slide now actually relates to the next question you're going to ask me, actually, Ian. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Right. So you, you've been in exercise immunology since um, the 1980s, before I even got, got started in this area. Um, what was your inspiration? Well, I think I'd have to say it was this man, really. It was uh, Professor Eric Newsholm uh, from the University of Oxford, who, as you can see, wrote quite a number of books on biochemistry, some of it pretty basic, some of it aimed at medical students. But he also wrote a few books about, um, you know, aim, aimed at the athlete. And the one on Keep On Running is a real classic, published back in 1994. But he could apply what he knew about basic biochemistry to the needs of the athlete and the metabolism during exercise. And his main, one of his main interests was this idea that athletes get ill when they do very prolonged exercise or intensified training. We've got this theory that maybe glutamine supplementation could help. Thinking, the thinking being that uh, perhaps a fall in plasma glutamine levels availability after prolonged exercise was one of the reasons why the functions of immune cells like lymphocytes and their ability to proliferate was uh, decreased after exercise because they are sensitive to glutamine. It's one of the, the main fuels that those types of cells use. And I went along to a lecture of his back in the early 1980s and thought what you know what a great idea what a good idea it would be to actually get into that kind of research because uh, uh, if there's any young academics out there listening I think it's a, an excellent idea to try and create your own little niche you know become a, a big fish in a small pond if you like to begin with uh, and uh, you know a good, a good way to develop your, your own name in, uh, in academic research. So that, that's just what I did and since I started doing it, lots of other people started doing it as well and the whole, uh, the whole area of research uh, really took off, not only 
to do with athletes, but also in the in the clinical and medical fields as well. I can recommend Keep On Running as well. It's a very good book. Um, are athletes actually more susceptible than job logs to infections? Um, if I could have the next question, slide. Yeah, build. you could have the next slide, please. Well, yeah, the simple answer is, well, um, yes, to a degree. Um, clearly, there were studies that have been done over the last 20 years that show that performing very prolonged bouts of exercise does uh, have an impact, a negative impact on immunity that could potentially increase the risk of infection. And people like David Neiman have reported over the years that uh, doing prolonged bouts of exercise like marathons and ultra marathons results in an increased incidence of infection amongst the runners compared to, you know, uh, people who were controls who didn't take part in, in the race. Having said that, we have to accept that doing moderate intensity exercise, not too much of it, but maybe an hour or two a day, uh, actually decreases the uh, incidence of infection. And we're talking here really about upper respiratory tract infections, the most common infections that everybody gets uh, but doing you know really long several hours of hard exercise continuous probably with limited ability to take in food and drink during the races that seems to impact uh, immunity in uh, a negative way so uh, if we move on to the next slide please Um, so you can see that various forms of stress we've known for a long time that psychological stress can depress immunity or so does the high physiological stress of exercise. You can also get depressed immunity if your sleep quality is poor or if your diet is uh, inadequate in certain proteins and uh, micronutrients. Um, and that can all you know increase your susceptibility to infections. The other thing that's important there is what's your exposure to these things that cause infections the viruses and uh, bacteria in the uh, in the environment uh, and then came the idea that well actually maybe not all of these symptoms that we get that we call upper respiratory tract illness symptoms maybe not all of them are actually caused by actual infection you might also in many cases uh, or certainly a high proportion of cases be caused by airway inflammation brought on by breathing cold, dry or, or polluted air. So now the consensus generally, I think, is that the overall incidence of infectious illness in athletes is probably not very different to that of the general population, unless they've performed recently very prolonged exercise or they're involved in periods of intensified training. Those are the situations, maybe competition as well, where there's the added psychological stress of performing well into expectations that also has an impact there. Can, can I just add to that, Mike? Um, something in my experience, I deal with, with a lot of recreational athletes who are very serious, but they have to do a day job and they've got family and they generally compromise their sleep and nutrition to, to get their training done. Um, and there they've definitely got uh, susceptibility. Whereas elite athletes who don't have to work can do their training session, go home, have a nap, take time to prepare their lunch, et cetera, et cetera. So, um, you know, it's looking at the big picture as well, isn't it? Well, yeah, there's, there's that, that, that's very true. I mean, at the end of the day, your body doesn't really distinguish between different forms of stress. So if you've got work stress on top of doing your recreational exercise, psychological stress because the wife's complaining that you're away all the time on your runs or whatever, you know, all of those things can add up. And, uh, you know, ultimately the recreational athlete can be just under just as much stress, if not more at some times than those who are at the elite level. With them, it's the periods of intensified training and the competition, I think, that are the, the real uh, things that harm immunity yeah okay so so are you ready to get into nutrition uh how nutrition influences our immunity 
Yes, indeed, yes. I mean, you could say pretty much probably the single most important thing for trying to maintain your immune function during stressful times is to make sure you avoid any deficiencies of the things that are important for maintaining robust immunity. And the, the first and foremost of those is your protein intake, ensuring that is adequate. Uh, and total energy as well is important. And then, uh, you know, quite a number of different micronutrients are involved. In fact, probably your immune system is depressed by pretty much anything that uh, becomes deficient if it's an essential nutrient, like one of your essential minerals or vitamins. Yes, some are more important than others. And some of these ones in the slide here that are listed like vitamin A, iron, zinc, copper, selenium, are some of the more important ones. And the, you know, inadequacies of these in the diet results in a whole multitude of different uh, aspects of immunity that are down-regulated or depressed and result in increased susceptibility to, to infection. Um, is the list you've got there the more studied ones, perhaps? Uh, to some degree, but others, quite a few others. For example, you know, vitamin C, vitamin E, mm. uh, several of, of the other minerals have been also studied. But uh, and, the, and on the other side of the equation, what we can actually measure as far as immune function goes, if you're measuring it in humans, you're largely limited to things you can take, you know, from the blood and measure functional uh, capacities in, in, in test tubes. There are some things you can do to test overall immunity, like responses to vaccination, but those two can be depressed by too much stress. Okay. Are there any from the list you've got there of uh, immune markers? Are there any particular ones in your mind are more important than others? If you could test one thing, as a representative of an athlete's immunity? Uh, that's a very difficult question to answer because you know, immune function is multifaceted. We've got defense mechanisms against bacteria, bacteria against fungi, against uh, viruses. Um, uh, you, we just pick a selection of things that we can actually measure and we think gives some overall indication of what's happening to immune function. There's probably thousands of things you could potentially measure and these are some of the more common ones because they have been perhaps some of the easier ones uh, to do. Uh, ones that's not listed on here would be things like saliva IgA which if you're talking about monitoring athletes that's probably the easiest one to do and the ones that the athletes would be most comfortable with because any of these other things like you know, require taking uh, you know, some volumes of blood more than you get from a finger prick. So, you know, involves a, an actual you know, needle in a vein and that's uh, not generally very popular with athletes. Yeah, that's great. Um, okay, so what about supplements? Um, if depletions in these nutrients can be problematic for the immune system, can supplements be helpful? Uh, there's evidence that some can. Could we have the next slide, please? I mean, one of those is uh, certainly uh, vitamin D. And this has been relatively recent. So this is you know, one of the things we've had to include in the new sport nutrition book, for example. That, uh, this wasn't really known uh, when we wrote the book you know, uh, eight, eight or nine years ago, the second edition. Uh, but now research has come out showing that vitamin D actually has an important boosting role in immunity. And the issue with this, of course, I'm sure many people have heard about now is that uh, uh, a lot of people in the, uh, the Northern Hemisphere in, in particular have uh, vitamin D deficiency or insufficiency during the, uh, the winter months. Because most of our vitamin D actually doesn't come from the diet. It's produced in the skin by the action of ultraviolet rays from sunlight. And from October to March in the UK, for example, they're just that sunlight just isn't it's strong enough to actually produce any significant amounts of vitamin D. And, and studies show that maybe as many as 50, 55 percent of the people in the general population, but also in the athletic population, are 
actually have inadequate levels of vitamin D and some are frankly deficient in vitamin D uh, during those winter months in particular. So it's certainly something that uh, uh, athletes would benefit from by supplementing with say somewhere between 1,000 and up to 4,000 international units per day during the winter months. So during the time of you know, pre-supplement era, obviously people were still living in the UK at that time. Um, what food items are particularly good in vitamin D that we might be eating less of? Uh, well, again, I'm not all that sure it's all that much to do with, with diet. I and mean, we get vitamin D from a variety of sources, uh, from things like uh, mushrooms that have been exposed to sunlight. Uh, from, uh, from, from fish and dairy products. Uh, but again, on average, probably about 80 to 90% of the vitamin D that's in your body now has come from what you've synthesized yourself by the action of uh, sunlight on, on, on cholesterol fats in your skin. Uh, and only, you know, therefore 10, 10 or 20% at most is coming from the diet. So just changing your diet to eat more you know, oily fish or eating more dairy products probably isn't going to do the trick. You really need to take a supplement to get your levels back up to where they should yeah. be and what's actually optimal for immunity. We're talking about, you know, the effects of deficiency here. The other question is what's actually the optimal amount of vitamin D we should have in our bodies to have our uh, immune system and our muscle and bone functions all at the, uh, you know, the optimal level. Yeah, and that's a, that word optimum is quite an important one because, um, you know, like under 30 nanomoles per litre, that's kind of what you'd find in a doctor's laboratory test. But some sources saying, you know, more like 100 nanomoles per litre might be more optimal uh, nowadays. Yeah, the current thinking is somewhere probably, up, certainly above 75 nanomoles per litre is somewhere getting near to what's probably uh, the optimal level. But those levels that's showing there for insufficiency, less than 30 nanomoles per litre. I know for a fact those have been found, for example, in quite a few, a few uh, Premier League footballers. Yeah, it's yeah, it's hard to get the vitamin D levels up. Um, I've got a colleague who's worked with one of the Tour de France teams, and these guys are out in the French sunshine five hours a day, but. Uh, some of them were vitamin D uh, quite insufficient. So it's, uh, it's, a, it's a tricky one. Well, um, can, and the same, I mean, if, they're, if they're out in the sunshine, they're probably slapping on the sun cream all the time, you see. So um, <laughs> the true. UV yeah. rays don't get through that then. So that, that, that then becomes an issue. Yeah. Getting the balance right. Um, okay. Any other nutrients you want to review before we go into inflammation? Well, the, a couple of others are, are, are worth mentioning, I think. Uh, probiotics are one that have been shown to reduce the incidence and severity of some respiratory infections in both the general population and in, uh, and in athletes. And these seem to work by affecting the immune system in the gut and, uh, and that then transferring to general systemic immunity to reduce infection risk. And if we move on to the next slide, please, that's I think it's the last one on the, the nutrition and immunity bit. Yeah, the, I mean, these are the current recommendations that we have that are included in the in the sport nutrition book and that in, the, in that uh, immuno nutrition consensus that was published by ISCI a couple of years ago. Um, you know, so it's all about you know making sure you avoid deficiencies, keeping well hydrated to keep saliva flow going both at rest and during exercise. And uh, the things that might work for athletes in terms of supplements are also shown there. So we mentioned vitamin D3, vitamin C is another. Probiotics, particularly the lactobacillus strains seem to be effective. Uh, the other main thing is flavonol flavonoids and polyphenols, you know, the phytonutrients that we get from uh, fruits and vegetables. That's, Num numerous studies have shown that uh, uh, people with higher vegetable and fruit intake have fewer respiratory infections than those that have low intake. So those are important as well. 
and then just the little things you can do to boost things just before competition because you know if you want to minimize your uh, time of illness if you actually come down with a problem during competition then if you're already on herbals like caloba or uh, taking ionic zinc before you've gone there you've got a chance of uh, reducing the number of days that you'll have those illness symptoms if you can get through the heat you might actually be able to make it to the final this even if you do get ill during competition um what about fermented foods mike have you and I know there's not much research there yet, but is there anything you picked up kind of through the, the grapevine that you can share? Um, not, not a lot on that. That's been certainly nothing significant that I've seen that's been done uh, in, in athletes. I mean, fermented foods are thought to be a healthy thing. And again, thought to perhaps improve your, uh, your, your gut function as well as the perhaps immune system but there's not really enough out there I think to make definitive conclusions about uh, what we should be having and how much we should be having in the diet of those. Yeah and scientifically it's very hard to standardize you know a portion of sauerkraut for example could contain a huge amount of variance depending on who made it and how it was made etc. So yeah. Okay, should we talk about inflammation? Go on, yep, yeah. go ahead. Yeah, so <sighs> intensive exercise can be pro inflammatory um, just because of the intensity of it and obviously creates oxidative stress as well. Um, gentle exercise may or may not improve an inflammatory response for health. What are, your, what are your thoughts about that? I think, well, my, my own opinion is that in general, exercise is very definitely anti-inflammatory. I still see papers, I saw one the other day that had come out uh, saying, you know, some hard exercise was, was pro-inflammatory. And frankly, I don't agree with that. I think in the situation where you get actual muscle damage, either because somebody's kicked you in a football game on the calf or you get damage to muscle fibers because you've been doing some eccentric muscle actions and it's caused some microtrauma amongst maybe 2% of your muscle fibers. Well, we know that the muscle then gets sore and it swells. Uh, and clearly that is an inflammatory response and it reduces the strength and power of that muscle group for a while, for at least maybe a week. Uh, but it's localized. That inflammation is localized to the muscle that's affected. In this picture, we see the person holding their right calf. The left calf doesn't have any inflammation in there. But this one got sore, and that's the one that's got the inflammation. But it's not systemic. It doesn't spread to the blood. You don't see a huge increase in pro-inflammatory cytokines in the blood, even after eccentric exercise. In fact, it's no different to what you see with normal, non-damaging, concentric exercise. Go move to the next slide, please. Here we see the actual cytokine response in response to two things. Firstly, into, in response to sepsis or infection. And what you see is initially a large rise in pro-inflammatory cytokines like tumor necrosis factor alpha TNF in that diagram. And then that's followed probably hours or days later by rises in anti-inflammatory cytokines. The initial response is needed to initiate the inflammation. And then after that, it's all about reducing the inflammation. The inflammation is, a, is about getting increased blood supply and getting white blood cells into that damaged area of tissue and doing something about it by removing dead and de decaying cells. And after that, it's a process of recovery and that needs an anti-inflammatory response to follow, which is what happens. But if you look in the, in the figure below, this is the response to exercise without any sign of infection or anything like that. What you see with exercise is virtually no increase whatsoever in any of the pro-inflammatory cytokines. 
Instead, you get an initial anti-inflammatory response with the release of IL-6 from the muscle itself that's been doing the contracting. And that's followed then by a cascade of other anti-inflammatory cytokines that are induced by IL-6. So exercise essentially is exclusively almost anti-inflammatory when it's not damaging. Could I have the next slide, please? Um, can you just say uh, something about the, the two phases of interleukin-6? Because a lot of people still think it's a pro-inflammatory cytokine, but you know it's got this dual modality to it. Uh, yeah, I, d I don't like that too, because it implies it can do both. And I think really what it is, it's an in it can be called, I suppose, an, an inflammatory responsive cytokine. It is elevated when you have inflammation present. That's true. Uh, in that situation, it's actually being produced by white blood cells. And that's to initiate the inflammatory reaction following so the anti-inflammatory reaction following a pro-inflammatory one. In the case of exercise, it's quite different. The IL-6 isn't coming from the white blood cells. It's actually coming from muscle. And one of the reasons it's coming from muscle is because it's actually having some metabolic effects as well. It's the muscle sort of saying, I'm running out of glycogen. When IL-6 gets released into the bloodstream, it promotes the release of cortisol to produce glucose through gl gluconeogenesis in the liver and it uh, promotes glycogen breakdown in the liver to release more glucose into the blood that the muscle can use as it's running out of glycogen but it wants, still wants to use preferentially carbohydrate fuel. So it's a very different situation. I think IL-6 coming from muscle shouldn't be necessarily considered to be the same as IL-6 when it's coming from white blood cells. Thanks for that clarification. And uh, here you see in, the, in this diagram, you know, the, the other, we're not only talking about the cytokine response to exercise, there are other effects of exercise that uh, also produce anti-inflammatory responses and actually inhibit and decrease the production of pro-inflammatory cytokines by white blood cells. And these things all actually to reduce chronic inflammation, which is why, one of the main reasons why is I, I think that exercise is, is good for your health because those cr that chronic inflammatory condition uh, is you know, associated with increased risk of all those nasty illnesses we get like you know, cardiovascular disease, type two diabetes and cancer. Right. And finally, this, this kind of study uh, confirms it. This came from Hinak Northos lab just a couple of years ago. And they measured gene expression in white blood cells taken from blood uh, after exercise, after some prolonged exercise. And what they found was, look at all those genes in the blue color there. There are all the anti-inflammatory ones. Those are all the ones that were upregulated after the exercise. The ones in the sort of purpley mauve color uh, are the pro inflammatory ones. In fact, all of those ones were downregulated. So clearly, there is an overall anti inflammatory bias of uh, gene regulation by, by exercise. Exercise switches on those anti inflammatory genes, you produce those anti inflammatory proteins you get your anti-inflammatory effect. You know, pro-inflammatory is going the other way. So that, that sort of crowns it for me that exercise is definitely anti-inflammatory and not pro-inflammatory. Okay, you ready for some football nutrition? Yes, yes, yeah, yeah fine, yeah. Let's, let, let's move on to the, to the football. I've been involved in this, uh, paper, I guess you can call it, it's a review paper, one of those uh, nutrition consensus papers that come out occasionally. Uh, this one's been essentially sponsored, well, not been paid anything for it, put it that way, but I mean, it's, it, it's being promoted by UEFA because they saw a need or we persuaded them there was a need to, uh, to have this new 
uh, consensus on nutrition in football. And uh, the focus is on elite player health and performance. But I'd say that this whole process started well over two years ago and uh, the paper still hasn't been published. There's one more meeting to go with the uh, UEFA uh, Medical Commission on the committee. Uh, and then it should be approved and then we can get in, in press. So it should be out, I would guess, probably uh, in a few months' time. So why is there a need, sorry, sorry, Mike, um, why is there a need for a new consensus? Um, okay, well, if, uh, what's just come up there is what I'm going to be talking about uh, on, on your, uh, your course in September. I'm going to split the talk into uh, two maybe 90 minute sessions. One's going to deal with nutrition for training and the secondly, second one on uh, perhaps after lunch on the match day nutrition. Uh, we move on to the next slide, please. Um, what I'm going to cover is, uh, you know, what, why is it important and why do we need this new consensus? How do you actually come about to produce a consensus? What's the actual process to bring that about? And, um, you know, what the main findings and the challenges were in putting this uh, together and then how can it actually be applied and made useful to, you know, practitioners in, in football? So if we could move to the next slide, please. I think that one shows us, well, yeah, first of all, first and foremost, nutrition guidelines need to be sports specific. The last actual football nutrition consensus review was in 2006. There's been some more general ones since then on, you're just on basically uh, nutrition in sport, uh, but not, nothing specific to, to football. And if we move on to the next slide, um, well, that's just what footballs want to be able to do. Uh, it's not answering your question. That's answered by the next slide actually. Yeah, this is why there's a need. Well, the last consensus was now 13 years ago. Since then, there's been a lot of changes in the technical demands of both training and match play. For example, players nowadays do about 30% more sprints and they cover about 30% more high intensity distance than they were doing uh, 12 years ago. Uh, we've now got you know, congested fixed list because of all these competitions that we have. Uh, matches need to be timed according to the needs of, of television. There's more frequent travel demands on players going, you know, across the country, but also uh, abroad as well for matches. Uh, and all of these things are going to influence the nutritional strategies that the, the people who are looking after the footballers have to, have, have to manage. Uh, nowadays, the top players play more games than they used to. They're always in demand. Uh, and so, you know, recovery is assuming even greater importance than it did in the past. And another reason we need a new consensus, of course, is since 12 years ago, uh, we've made quite a number of advances in our understanding of both, uh, you know, carbohydrate requirements, protein requirements and the timing and the type of protein we should be eating in and around training sessions and after match play for recovery. There's been new developments in ergogenic aids. We're talking 12 years ago, nobody had come up with beetroot juice and nitrate as an ergogenic and that's big now. And the whole story about vitamin D and its importance for immunity as well as for muscle function and as well as bone. Uh, you know, is, is all pretty new stuff. So we need to incorporate that into the, uh, into the new paper. And then you've got other populations as well. The, the female game has expanded considerably in the last 10 years or so. Uh, there's lots of juniors now in academies that are in high demand and they're put, being put through the same sorts of training schedules that some of the senior pros do. But their needs are quite different in some respects, as, as we, we can discuss, as I, I will discuss as part of the, uh, the talk I'll be doing in, in September. But basically their needs are a bit different from some of the adults. We can't just say, just because 
uh, you know, a senior pro is recommended to have four grams of carbohydrate per kilogram body mass per day. Uh, for on a particular training day, that that should necessarily be the same for the uh, for the junior player. Uh, and then on top of all that, you've got all the influx of players from countries which we're, we didn't normally associate with football maybe 10, 20 years ago, particularly the African countries, people coming from the Middle East as well. Uh, and they're all training, competing, and they have certain, you know, cultural and religious requirements, such as, uh, for example, you know, uh, fasting during Ramadan. And, you know, that obviously has an impact on the sort of nutritional advice you can give them. So that needs to be taken into consideration as well. There are lots of reasons really why a new consensus is needed. And this is the uh, essentially what we're trying to cover. The whole remit of the, uh, the consensus paper is to cover all these different aspects you know, in a reasonable amount of detail and in practical terms as well that people can understand. I mean, this is going to be a scientific paper, make no doubt about it. It's going to be evidence-based. But what we're also going to do in addition to the consensus paper is produce some you know practical guideline books that can be read by the the coaches the athletes the nutritionists who deal with the players on a day-to-day -day basis and the players themselves so that it can all be uh, you know put into understandable terms and hopefully you can translate some of the things about uh, you know carbohydrate needs protein needs etc into actually you know what sort of food you should be eating Uh, and then these are some of the contribu well, the, 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 the contributors, if you add them up there, there's 25 people that have contributed to this consensus statement. And I guess that's one of, one of the reasons why it takes quite so long to, to put it all together. It's almost been taking as long as Brexit. Uh, you know, it's, uh, <laughs> it, it can be frustrating at times, but, you know, everybody gets the chance to have an input. And at the end of the day, we went as many as people as possible to be able to agree on as many of the points as possible that we're trying to include. That's what a consensus is at the end of the day, getting general agreement from the, you know, the expert scientific community about what we should be saying and making sure it is all evidence-based and not anecdotal. And that's essentially what the process has been. Each of us was assigned a particular topic area. I was asked to be in charge particularly of uh, a section on staying healthy during the season. You know, and I have a very important focus from my research in the health of the, the athlete, or in this case, the, you know, the football player. Because my firm belief is that, you know, if, if athletes and footballers are not healthy, they're never going to be able to perform to the best of their ability. So for me, health, and I'm sure that's the same with you, Ian, is, you know, is a pivotal part of the performance paradigm. We've got to get healthy athletes to make sure they will be able to perform to their full potential. Uh, so we did that. We, we then come up with a, a draft of our section that then goes to uh, well, essentially back to everybody, not just to the consensus coordinators. It was sent around everybody to comment on. Uh, but I guess the consensus coordinator, the ones, the ones that feel perhaps most responsible for making sure we do get back some comments, both negative and positive, uh, and encourage people then to come up with a, a second draft. And then we could say, well, second draft, third draft, fourth draft, fifth draft, in some cases for some of these... Uh, some of these sections, this is rather simplifies the, uh, the process here. But when we're eventually happy with the paper, it then gets, it got sent then to the uh, UEFA Medical Committee. And we got comments back from them. Some good, well, mostly good, I would say. Some bad, and some I would probably have to say not very well informed from the scientific perspective. Mm -hmm. But, you know, uh, we take those on board and we either, you know, rebut those criticisms or we come up with a, you know, a suitable answer to, to remedy the problem. 
and then we come up with the final draft and that's pretty much where we're at now it's now gone back to a final look to the uefa medical committee there's going to be a meeting with them uh, i think it's next next week uh, and then hopefully things will be signed off unofficially we've heard the only things they want to have additional comment on is the issue of supplementation and doping and what we say about that and then yeah. we're done then we get the paper and after that we write the practical guidelines okay yeah the supplementation and doping is a it's a big current uh, discussion with likes of informed sport isn't it yes yes there's a very real risk of course if you're using things from you know unchecked sources that uh, there's a risk of contamination and then you know of a player getting a doping ban which well might not be career ending but you know it might mean they're banned for six months a year two years whatever so uh, definitely everybody wants to avoid that yeah so these are the key themes of the, of the consensus and what i'll be talking about in september do with uh, you know training day training days nutrition it's pretty much different on every day of course for footballers because the training isn't the same every day it varies day to day in relation to the timing of the next match and recovery from from that and then there's the specifics of what you actually feed the players and give them to drink and the timing of that on uh, match day itself so it's the lead up to the actual performance to maximize performance then immediately after the match it's back to you know recovery uh over the next day or two and then the the thorny issue of supplementation certainly there are quite a number of supplements used in football some are probably not needed um, and some are much more common than others probably for good reason because they're probably the, some of the ones that we think work effectively could we move on Next slide, thank you. So training nutrition, move on from that. That's just showing a picture of the players doing a typical training session there. Next slide, please. So for example, we look at carbohydrate. Um, say it can vary from day to day, depending on the day of the week in relation to match time. But we also have to look at, you know, personalized issues. We have to look at the, uh, you know, the, the time of the year. So, Carbohydrate intake is going to probably be different in pre-season compared with in-season. Uh, certain times of the season you have congested fixture periods where carbohydrate intake is going to be need to be higher. And then you've got the off-season when the players go away on holiday for a few weeks. And that. So these things are going to be different. The training objectives at these different times of year are, are different. And the, you know, the training adaptations or maintenance of performance and sometimes you're just looking for uh, at these different times of year uh, is also different. So these influence the actual amounts of carbohydrate we recommend. And even these have a, have a range because it depends what they're actually doing again on a day-to-day -day basis, particularly you know, during the season itself. Uh, so if we, if we move on from that, and then on to, to match day nutrition, here I'll be looking at it from the perspective of, uh, you know, how do you prepare an athlete nutritionally on the, in the lead up to say a game that might, in this example, be a, you know, a one o'clock kickoff in, in, in the afternoon. So starting from waking up, you know, breakfast, or what might be essentially for this, this time of game, a, a pre-match meal, how much you're having. It's mostly here, of course, about really about carbohydrate and fluid and uh, you know whether or not you're going to use acute acting ergogenic aids in the lead up to the game um, the only two I can really think of there that I know I regularly use would be caffeine and uh, nitrate usually in the form of beetroot juice and, and I could talk about some specific examples that have been used with uh, a club I've had some involved involvement with Leicester City uh, and what we did in the uh, in that year that they actually won the Premier League as 5,000 to 1 outsiders that might get a few people interested I think 
Uh, I'm not sure it's been released that information before altogether in its, uh, the detail I can give it, but the lucky people who will be going along in September can find out about that. <laughs> and then uh, at half time, uh, kick off and then, you know, what, half time again, fluid, maybe caffeine, uh, caffeine gum possibly is, uh, is used by some clubs I know, particularly for players who might not have had caffeine, uh, you know, in, in the morning before the match. As a something that can get inside there quickly and be absorbed quickly and be effective very quickly, and then uh, essentially full time and beyond is uh, again going back to, you know, getting recovery and adaptation, uh, kicking in as soon as possible by appropriate intake of fluid, carbohydrate, and protein. Okay. Can we move on to the next one? Yes, yeah, supplements. Uh, so I'll talk about the prevalence of supplement use in football, the popular ones amongst the micronutrients, it's probably vitamin D, iron and calcium. Sports foods, some people call these supplements, just some people just call them, you know, specialized foods, but we could include them as supplements. And there we're talking about, you know, sports drinks, uh, cereal bars and the like, carbohydrate gels, protein shakes, etc. And then the, the ergogenics, and those are the big four, I would say, in football. Caffeine and nitrate as acute, sort of pre-match ergogenics. They might be used in training as well, to a degree. And uh, used in training to boost the training adaptation uh, and boost, uh, when, or in terms of beta alanine, boosting uh, uh, buffering capacity of muscle by increasing carnosine synthesis in the muscle. Those are the ones that are probably mostly used. And then I'll talk a little bit about, of course, this, this thorny issue of the, the risk of doping and, you know, whether it's really worth taking supplements. I wouldn't take anything personally or recommend any footballer to take something that hadn't been proven to be effective and couldn't be got from a source that could prove that it was free of contaminants might cause a positive doping test. Um, lots of athletes take supplements. It seems around about on average 80 to 90 percent if you look at multiple sports of athletes are taking supplements and it's not very different in football. Although surprisingly there's actually only two published studies that we've been able to find on supplement use or prevalence of supplement use in relatively large numbers of footballers. One of those showed, you know, 93% of footballers taking some form of supplement. That included some of the sports foods like gels and sports drinks. And the other one that excluded those things was 43%. But if you added those in as well, it's going to be up where all the other sports are. So supplement use in football is pretty much the same as in many of the other sort of endurance and power sports. Uh, I'll perhaps also mention on some of the uh, nutritional ergogenic aids that I think of reasonable evidence that they work and why some of these like creatine, beta alanine, caffeine and nitrate seem to be popular in football and other ones like maybe carnitine and, and bicarbonate although perhaps effective ergogenics in some situations are generally not used uh, by footballers. But, uh, we won't go into too much detail now, I think. I think cause that's, uh, that's for another time when we've got more time to discuss these issues. And finally, what about junior players? I mentioned they, they were an issue as well as female players. Uh, but clearly for these guys, some of them are coming from school. Some of them have done a PE session at school and they've done a full, you know, full day schooling. They arrive at a club academy around about four o'clock in the afternoon and they get subjected to four or five hours of fairly intensive training. And some of these guys are not getting enough energy. And I'll talk about that issue and their, and their macronutrient needs and why they might actually be different to the senior players and in some cases actually higher than the senior players because some of these kids are doing more training than the senior pros do. There's also differences in their micronutrient requirements 
Some of those are higher, like calcium and phosphorus for both boys and girls compared with adults, and iron for boys. There's a greater need for that in them than there is in, in adult men. So yeah, there are some issues and we shouldn't be encouraging these like, young guys to take supplements. You know, let's see what talent they've got on the training pitch without supplements. And then, you know, they can take them when they needed, when they progress to the, uh, you know, the under 23s and the, uh, and the senior teams. And I think that was my last slide. Thank you, Mike. Um, do you mind if I ask you a question about the football? Um, you mentioned your your part is your part of the consensus was to um, was regarding keeping the players healthy through the season. Um, so you gave us some carbohydrate guidelines and uh, supplements and ergogenics and um, match day information. What's in a general nutrition sense, pulling all the macros and micros and in your mind are the most important practical inputs for a footballer, given their standards? You know, a lot of footballers don't eat well, um, but it's thankfully slowly become more um, common for footballers to think about their nutrition. So what, what are your general pieces of advice? Well, yeah, I think you've hit the nail on the head there. The, perhaps the most important thing is, is the education of the individuals and that education coming through the you know, nutritionist or dietitian that works with them on a day-to-day -day basis. You know, you, you can control what the players do to a degree, you know, when they're there at the training ground and they might actually have lunch or a post-training uh, meal at the training ground in, in the canteen. Most of the top clubs have their own canteens and chefs that uh, you know provide very good quality food. And the nutritionist needs to have an input there with the chef to be able to you know, uh, influence what they're, what they're giving them and the reasons they're give, giving those, those food choices that they can have and what to avoid. Uh, but also impressing on the players. And if it's young players, perhaps they're their parents and for other players, it might be, the, might be their wives, girlfriends, whatever, you know, their partners that, uh, you know, what they should be having when they're, when they're not actually there at, at the ground. At the end of the day, the players have to take responsibility for their own health and ultimately performance. We can advise them what to do. We can, you know, give them the supplements when they're there at the training ground as soon as they're away you know i mean that's uh they're out of you know the control of the the nutritionist you also also mentioned something that's quite important is the junior uh junior footballers um i, I see i personally see maybe from early teens on until adulthood in terms of athletes i had a 13 year old swimmer on monday for example and as you rightly say, some of them are really challenged because, yeah, they're getting a, a rushed breakfast at home before they got car carted off to school. And then it's quickly in the car, a snack after school as they get carted to their training. And they're not eating proper meals just because their they're, they're day is packed. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And, and, the, and therefore, they're not getting enough energy or protein or carbs, possibly fluid as well, for what or, they've got to get exposed to when, when they actually go and do those four or five hour training sessions. Yeah. You know, and, and what's the consequence of that? Then, then you end up getting, you know, the kids start getting fractures. Yeah, that's, you know, that's the scary thing. You know, if they, they don't get enough energy and they're not getting enough calcium, they're not getting enough protein, they're going to end up with weak bones for one thing. You know, so the incidence of fractures and injuries uh, increases. And this has been noted at some clubs, and I, I won't name names, but, you know, uh, we've, we've heard a story from one of the people that's on the consensus uh, paper uh, talking about this issue. They realised this was happening at the club. They actually did something about it. You know what they did about it? As soon as those kids arrive around at four o'clock at the training ground, they give them a big protein and carb shake thousand calories 
thousand calories. That's what they reckon they were in energy deficit on those days when they were training as well as being at school. You know, uh, so you can do things about it, but you've got to identify the problem to begin with and then, and then sort it. Yeah. Great. Thank you, Mike. Uh, we're, we're now sort of just running over the hour. So are you, are you okay to answer a few questions on Facebook if we get some questions in? I, if you can send me the, the questions by email, I'll be very happy to yeah. send those back and you can post them on Facebook if you wouldn't Great. mind. Thank you. Yeah. Wonderful. Um, so, yeah, thanks, Simon, for putting up the, the last slide here. Um, these are just contact details for anyone who um, has come onto this and find, finds the, the topics interesting. So browse the website, uh, you've got the Facebook information, Twitter information there, um, all the necessaries nowadays of social media. Um, as I say, I'll post any questions um, or someone will probably post questions on Facebook um, and We'll, we'll, we'll get the answers from Mike and we can do a bit of interaction. Um, likewise, with regards to the, the course, so this is the second of three webinars in the, in the free series. Uh, so they're very much sharing information, but also giving you little, little hints of what the, the course is about, the Certificate of Integrative Sports Nutrition. So if any of you are interested in that course, Pop us, uh, pop us an email or get in touch with any of these sources and uh, we'll give you more information on that. So thank you very much, Mike. Uh, I really yeah, appreciate you. that. And we'll, uh, yeah, we'll be in touch soon and uh, look forward to having you on the course later this year. Okay, see you in London. Yeah, thanks, Mike. Okay, bye. Bye for now.